Nope, we don't need to speed up the process. We don't need to nuke this. You know why? Because this is the non-microwave truth. I am CL Whiteside, and this is brought to you by Time of Grace Ministry. If this is your first time tuning into the podcast today, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I'm glad that you are with us. We love to start the podcast off with the first world problem. It's not something that's really a problem, but something to get you thinking about yourself, examining yourself, thinking about some things you have seen or some things that you have observed and just like, how, how would you answer this? And our first world problem question today is this. Who is most likely to be on a person's side, even when they know that that person is wrong? So even when a person is wrong, they know that person is wrong, but they still going to be like, I'm going to defend them to the end or act like they are not wrong. Is it A, a spouse, a husband and wife? You ever seen that? Like the, the, the wife is clearly wrong and the man is like, hey, baby, it's OK. You 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 right. You you right. Come on, babe. You, you wrong for doing this. I'm like, no, bro, your wife is wrong. And that man defends his wife even when she is wrong and acts like she is not wrong. And you like, I know, bro. I know, bro. No, she is wrong. Or is it B, a parent to a child? I know some of y'all get that phone call. and It's like little Timothy today was standing in his chair and he screamed in front of the whole entire class. Oh, no, my baby wouldn't do that. He don't. We taught him better than that. And it's like, you know, little Timmy is at home usually clowning. So why are you trying to uphold his wrong act like that's that that's so far fetched? Or is it see a sibling like a brother and a sister upholding each other's wrong, knowing that they did some wrong? Or is it D? You could even add one. I want to hear from you, though. Instagram or Twitter handle is champion life 23. If you're on YouTube, drop it in the comments. And if you like, oh, I got a good story for you. Go ahead and even share that story with me. But just don't put any names in it. Because we don't want this to turn into the shade room. But you can tell me about what you have noticed or what you have observed with groups that are upholding wrong or standing on someone else they know being wrong. Is it A, though, a spouse? Is it B, a parent to a child? Is it C, siblings? Or is it D, you can even add your own? I want to hear from you, though. And this is our first word problem. It is dinner time. The title of our episode is Child Religion, the new religion of our culture. And if you tuned into the podcast before, you've heard me say that one of the toughest jobs in the entire world is being a parent. Like without a doubt, being a parent is a full time job. It's a tough job. It's one of those that takes a ton of energy because you are constantly working with your child. You got to have the energy to battle. And I know some of y'all are, are battling. I'm praying for you that you stay strong. And I just want you to think about this passage that comes from Proverbs 22, verse 6, because this is what God is telling us. And even those who, who work with young people, work with kids and help and train up, it says this, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, if you like, I don't have any kids, this is still an episode for you because you have had parents or you have parents. And you can start thinking like, man, did my parents worship me? Did my parents ever go crazy for me? Did I ever manipulate my parents or get them going where all of a sudden they did start acting crazy or they did worship me? So this is one of those things you can constantly be thinking about as you listen to this episode. And I made this episode for myself because I don't want to be one of those parents. I don't want to be one of those parents that worships their child and takes it takes it too far. I want to be smooth in that. Now, just think about when, when parents see that little baby for the first time. Oh, my gosh, he's so perfect. And it's like I, I they saying like it's a good looking baby or something. Some of these babies don't be good looking. Though. I don't know what you say when it's not good looking. But think about that. No baby is perfect. Every single person is born in sin and has sin except one. And that's Jesus Christ. He's the only one where his mama and daddy could look at him for the first time and say, oh, my goodness, little baby Jesus. He's perfect because he really is perfect. He really is perfect. But a lot of times parents are looking at their children and they are they are worshiping them. But you just got to realize why is that, though? Because it's, it's no love like a parent's love. You hear about those stories where a woman all of a sudden gets super strength and be able to lift a car off her baby, off her kid. It's like love, love changes you in a way. Love definitely changes you. Or have you ever heard somebody like, that's my baby. You like, miss, he's 28. I don't care. He's still my baby. He's always going to be my baby forever and ever. He's going to be my precious little Jew. Ha, I'm taking a shot at somebody right there. Now, for me, 
um, I work in school, I, I work in coaching, and most of the parents are, they're, they're pretty good. They're okay. But there are definitely some parents. There are definitely some people who worship their kids. They absolutely worship their kids. And there's something that we all have to guard against that we usually do that makes us all of a sudden start to worship children and, and practice child worship. And one of the things is, as parents, we want our kids to look the best. We want them to get their recognition. We want them to have great experiences. And sometimes we, we go too far with it. Sometimes we like, man, I never, ever want my kid to be in pain. I never, ever want my kid to struggle. I never, ever want them to feel embarrassed or to, to have hurt feelings. And sometimes we protect them to a fault and we, we do way too much. And a lot of times parents are like, man, I don't want my kid to have any hardships. And I'm not talking about like hardships because somebody's actually physically uh, abusing you or physically or not physically abusing, you, but also verbally abusing you. But I'm talking about just regular good obstacles, challenge, challenges and, and hardships. And I just want you to think about this. If you have ever scheduled a meeting, if you have ever sent that email, if you have ever made that post, if you have ever chose to say that, say that comment, then you probably are that parent who has fell prey to being a child worshiper, you probably didn't fail prey. And we're going to talk about that. And one of the big things I want to just look at is where do a lot of parents lose it or where do, where does child worship seem to be prevalent? It's that desire to promote and to pump up a, a child. And every single parent is susceptible to this. And I want to look at Matthew chapter 20. This is the NLV version. This is a mother who's coming to Jesus. She brings her two sons and just look at what she says and look at her request. The mother of Zebedee's children, James and John, came to Jesus with her sons. All right. Now, check out this respectful approach. I'm putting this in air quotes. She got down on her knees before Jesus to ask something of him. Now, a lot of parents do this. They do a lot of promoting and they disguise it saying like they're advocating for their child in a respectful way. It's like one of those things where people say like no disrespect. But what does that mean? That means they about to disrespect you or Hey, I don't mean to overstep my boundaries, but you know, you're stepping, you're overstepping your boundaries, but you're just trying to justify it. Or, Hey, I'm not being selfish. I just, this is, this is what I think. And a lot of times we look at it and say, you know, I'm not making a crazy post on social media or I'm not as crazy as this person, but that doesn't change the fact that we still could be worshiping our child. We still could be selfish. We still could be um, rooted in selfishness and, and, and pride. Because I know there's always going to be people that we look and say, man, they're crazier than me. So sometimes that makes us feel good about ourselves. Look at verse 21, though. Jesus said to her, what do you want? Listen to what she asked for. She said, say that my two sons may sit, one at your right side and one at your left side when you are king. Now, you know how many parents have asked or demand or been indifferent when it doesn't go as they have planned in their minds, like think about how many parents feel some type of way when it doesn't go the way they have planned it in their minds. Like parents wanting to see their children honored. That's super dangerous. That is super dangerous because a lot of times it's not aligned with what God wants or what God's word says to do or, or teaches us about. Because what do we want? We want the we want the glamour. We want the prestige. We want the accolades. We want the records. We want it to look a certain way. Now, listen to what Jesus said to her in verse 22. Jesus said to her, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to take the suffering that I am about to take? And what we forget sometimes is God can have a different plan for our children, for our kids, for all of us. That's not so he can have a different plan. That's not so prestigious. It's not so flashy. But it becomes child worship when we want to go against God's plan. And a lot of us fall into that child worship because we want to promote or we want to pump up our kids and have them look a certain way. That's planned out in our hand. And we didn't even run this past past God. So why is it so easy? Why is it so easy to, to fall prey to child worship? Why is it so easy? And a lot of times you think about it. Think about this. We see ourselves in our kids. We definitely see ourselves in our kid. And part of our worship in our kids a lot of times is like rooted in a selfishness that we're trying to like worship ourselves and get a second chance at something or get a second chance at life. Like I've heard so many parents say like, man, I wish I would have had someone defend me in this way. I wish someone would have advocated for me in that way. I wish someone would have done fill in the blank for me. 
but it gets taken too far. It definitely gets taken too far. Now, in this episode of child worship, the new religion of our culture, there are some other things that are attached to this that we can fall prey to. But I think a lot of us will look and say, yep, that person right there, that person, oh, that they're a child worshiper. Oh, yeah, they are definitely worshiping their child. And the first way you know that somebody's worshiping a child is when they look and they say, my child doesn't do any wrong. They act like their child does no wrong. And a lot of times they out here lying for their kids. Their kids are like, mom, I didn't do that. They're like, oh, poor baby, I know you didn't do it. And it's like, look at the camera. Look, look at the camera. Or look at the messages they sent. You know your kid did that. Mom, someone took my phone. That wasn't me. Oh, okay. Yeah, I believe you, baby. And some parents actually do that. But listen to what Proverbs 13 verse 1 says. It says a wild, a wise child accepts a parent's discipline. A mocker refuses to listen to correction. And a lot of times as parents, we can end up being the mocker. Like God is telling us how to raise our children, but we are refusing to do it. And a lot of times we, we say, I don't want to discipline this kid or I don't want to say that they were wrong because then that makes me look like a bad parent. And it's like, I got breaking news for you. Every single kid is going to be wrong except Jesus. He's the only one who wasn't wrong because we are all sinners. So don't try to uphold wrong and be on their side to, to a fault that's going to end up damaging them in, in the long run. Now, this is something that's big, too. How many parents want to justify kids wrong or make excuses for kids being wrong? Um, I, I've heard this a lot working in education. You know, I, I just don't think the consequence fits. Like, what they did was bad, but it wasn't that bad. Like, Sure, she bit a teacher and she throws tantrum, but she doesn't need counseling. And it's like, what? Did you hear what you just said? And how many parents justify their child's wrong or try to make it seem lesser or they don't want to take they just don't want to take um, take responsibility for it. But the passage Proverbs 13 verse 24 tells us whoever spares the rod hates their children. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them careful to discipline them. So when we don't discipline our, our kids, it's like we hate them because we know they're going to grow up and be messed up then. It says, but the one who loves the children is careful to discipline them. So discipline is love. That is part of loving a child. It, it definitely is. Another way that people worship their children is my baby can be anything that he wants. And it's like, well, does God's word actually say that? Like in a lot of cases, that's not even important. That's not what God's word says. God's word says, you know, take up your cross and follow me. And we're reminded to do things God's way. And we shouldn't give in to every single thing that we want to do. And nowadays parents are saying, well, if they want to do it, that's I'm just going to love them and support them. And it's like, do you see what God's word says, though? Like you are literally allowing your child to be the authority and saying to God's word, ah, you're a secondary authority or you're not authority at all. Their feelings and what they want is the most important thing. And that's how it becomes child worship. Listen to what Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five through nine says. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now, let somebody say God's not good. Most of us will be like, well, that's that person's opinion. I don't really care. But let someone say your child isn't good or your child is bad at something. Woo. Some people might be flipping tables. They might be flipping tables and going crazy. Um, excuse me, you're not going to talk about my child in that way. I'm going to need you to back off. Like, Listen to what the rest of this passage says. It says, these commandments that I give you today are, are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So God is saying... Number one thing, love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. That is the number one priority. That is the number one priority of, of where our love should be. And the rest will, will, will work out perfectly. It will work out perfectly when we focus on God first. Um, another example of child worshiper, you can say like, oh, this person definitely is a child worshiper, is they hate. They absolutely hate to see their child struggle. They don't want to see their child struggle. They don't want to see their child fail. And I guess in a way, none of us do, right? But there also comes a point in time where it's like, Every challenge and every obstacle that a child has is not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, it can actually help the child grow. And we're reminded with that in Hebrews 12, verse 11, it says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. 
Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. What does it produce? A harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So, so many parents run, want to run to their kids rescue or just run to their kids defense when something didn't go and they didn't get 100 percent or they didn't score a whole bunch of points in the game or they didn't get the part. And it's like, no, this this is OK. Th this is absolutely OK. And for parents, it's one thing to like provide. It's another thing to sacrifice and to worship your kid. And Matthew 6, verse 33 tells us, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. I want you to just think about how do you spend your time and your money? And especially if you got kids, how do you spend your time and your money? So many, I've seen so many people, especially with Christmas, they breaking their arm and their leg to try to get a kid some new shoes or get their kid this, this vacation that they promised. And it's like, you are literally making this child your God. Think about how some of these birthday parties out and saying like, sweet. Sweet 14, I didn't even say 16, sweet 14, like, what, what are you doing? You spending thousands of dollars on the birthday party? It's like, oh, okay, you give a little money to the church, you give a little money to God. Nope, but we don't do that, though. And how many times have we seen parents who are more concerned with making their kid happy versus training their kid up in, in God's way, want to give them everything? Sometimes parents uh, and people that deal with kids, we just don't have the energy to, to battle. I remember it talking to a parent she's like yeah he better not bring a baby home and i'm just like yeah he better keep his dipper in the zipper and she stuff yeah i'm just gonna give him some condoms i'm like whoa what what you gonna give him some condoms you, that's that's mixed message right there so you tell him to responsibly sin but i just don't have the energy and time to go back and forth from he gonna do what he want to do and it's like no not necessarily you need to tell him that you believe what god's word says that he should wait and that is wrong because kids not always gonna act like Yes, mom. Yes, dad. I hear what you're saying. I'm going to follow it. They might even give you some back talk. They might even. But a lot of times they are listening. And th that just sends mixed messages when you do something like, all right, I'm going to give you a box of condoms, but I'm telling you to be safe, even though you shouldn't be doing this. It's like, what, what what's going on? We got to have the energy to actually battle. And that's why I say it's one of the toughest jobs in the world. You need the energy. God can provide you with the energy to, to battle and to stand on his word for sure. Now, I want to look at I want to look at a, an example of parents who who got made the, the kids made them crazy and this is in genesis chapter 25 this is abraham's son isaac and i just want you to see how he responded when he had kids it says isaac prayed to the lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless the lord answered his prayer and his wife rebecca became pregnant i'm gonna jump to like verse 27 verse 27 tells us esau was a skillful hunter a man of the open country while jacob was content to stay at home among the tents Verse 28 tells us Isaac, that's the dad, had a taste for wild game. He loved Esau, but Rebecca, that's the mom, she loved Jacob. So they pretty much had, they had favorites. They literally had favorites. The mom and the dad each had a, a favorite, twin boys. Now, later in chapter 25, we see that Esau, he sold his birthright to Jacob for some food. He sold his birthright to Jacob for some food. Hungry, but just, just hungry. Now, some of you like, what in the world is a birthright? What's the big deal? Okay. So a birthright is something that gives you like special honor. It was special honor for the firstborn. That meant that the firstborn son, he would get double the portion of inheritance. And on top of this, he would be the he would have the honor of being like the, the family leader, family leader when the dad dies. So let's jump to Genesis chapter 27. And there's so many lessons to learn from this as parents and people who deal with kids from Isaac and Rebecca. So many lessons to learn. It says this. It says, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, here I am. He answered, Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, this is an example of a father wanting to make his son's life easy, wanting to make his son's life very cushiony and eliminate eliminate tough times. But that doesn't always work. And I think about that the story I heard with like a butterfly, a caterpillar in a cocoon and it's turning into a butterfly and somebody saw the cocoon and it looked like the butterfly was struggling to get out. And you know what the person did is they cut the cocoon. 
And when they cut the cocoon, the butterfly came out, but the butterfly could no longer fly because it didn't have the training. It didn't have that, that tough workout of busting out of the cocoon. And this is like a perfect example of that to me. And I look at, I want you just to look at like how both parents are trying to manipulate a situation or circumstances for their children because it doesn't go along with what they had envisioned or what they had planned. Verse five says this. It says, now Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to her, spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca said to her son, Jacob, look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that you may so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. So listen to what Jacob says. The son says. He said this to his mother. He said, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. So he like, mama, what? You want me to do what? Like Esau super hairy. I got smooth skin. Like you're going to make me get cursed, mom. And if you look at this, this comes out of a good place, right? A lot of times for, for parents, this comes out of a good place. One in our children, one in our child children to be blessed but it's like all right at what expense at what expense do you want your child to be blessed now remember in verse remember in genesis chapter 25 verse 3 she already had been told that the younger would be greater than the older go read about that genesis chapter 25 verse 3 already been told that and this is where we get ourselves in, in trouble is we start going outside of god's way and trying to help god this is a prime example of devotion to your child going way too far now listen to what verse 13 says his mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say and get them for me. Like, did you catch what the mom said? Did you catch what the mom said? Now, coaching, I have seen this so much where the athlete gets it more than the parent. The athlete gets it more than the parent. It's like, man, my mom is tripping a little bit or my dad is tripping a little bit. But parents sometimes can't see that because they want their child to be blessed. And they have a vision for their child and they don't care if it goes outside of God's will or not. Verse 14 says, so he went and got them and brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebecca took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and she put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with goat skins. She out here scheming. Then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. And it, it ended up working. It ended up working from the standpoint of Isaac ended up blessing Jacob. But boy, that caused so many problems. It caused so many problems. Esau finally came back. Isaac is like, hold up. I, who was that? Like, I, what, what happened? Just go read about that and the rest of it. He had to run away because Esau wanted to kill him then. His mom like, I heard Esau wants to kill you, so you better take off. So her manipulating the situation and being a child worshiper, it, it, it made it even worse. And I just want to wrap this episode by just reminding us. We, we can love our children. We can defend our children. We can advocate for our children. But we got to realize there's only one who is worthy of worship. Only one child has ever been worthy of worshiping, and that's Jesus. And that's like, okay, why is Jesus the only one worthy of worship? Jesus is our creator. Jesus is our God. He is true. We got to remember, we are created in God's image. A lot of times we look at these, these kids and say they're in our image. It's like, no. We, who do we come from? Who, who's our true father, our, our, our heavenly father? Uh, Jesus is worthy of worship because he's the one who traded places with us. He paid a debt that we couldn't pay for ourselves. Jesus is the one who dedicated his life to us. I know sometimes parents are like, man, I dedicated my life to my son or my daughter. It's like, no, dedicate your life to God. And God is going to allow you to love your child, but you're going to be doing it in, in the right way. And Jesus is the one who makes all of us proud to be followers. He, he absolutely does. He absolutely does. Jesus is the one who loves us so much that we can't even comprehend a lot of times how much he loves us, how much he know, loves us. But we know it's true because the Holy Spirit has absolutely revealed this to, to us Christians and to us followers. And Jesus is the one whose will is not based off of selfishness. It's not based off of, of pride. It is based off the grace and the mercy. It is full of grace and mercy. It is full of grace 
and mercy. And he's the one who makes us worthy and he gives us the new status of perfect, redeemed member of God's family. And, and child worshiping, that ain't it. We are what? We are perfect, redeemed member of God's family. And this is the non-microwave truth. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Child Worship, the new religion of our culture. Peace punch, Captain Crunch, to know the drugs and yes to Jesus. I am out.